Welcome to section three of the viruses. This is our virus overview figure, and in this video, we will be discussing the next herpes virus, Epstein-Barr virus, which you can see right here. Now this little village belongs to the cutest little elves. For this reason, they call this place Elves Blue Village, or EBV. EBV stands for Epstein-Barr virus, so Elves Blue Village for EBV. Now all these elves are nocturnal, so they only come out at night. See the dark color scheme? We like to use a dark color scheme to represent DNA viruses, so dark colors for DNA virus. Now this elf colony has only one female. As you can imagine, she's pretty pompous and has established a kissing booth and now sells her kisses as currency. Well, this kissing booth of hers represents the fact that EBV infections are spread via saliva or kissing. So kissing booth for spread through kissing. Having just received his kiss, this elf is falling asleep, totally overtaken by the girl. This represents the fatigue that most people with EBV infections experience. So fainting elf for fatigue. The next elf in line is fairly nervous for his turn. You can see him there pulling on his collar, all cute and nervous-like. Anyways, we like to use this action of pulling out the collar to represent pharyngitis or sore throat. So pulling on the collar for pharyngitis. And patients with EBV infections often experience pharyngitis. So pulling on the collar for pharyngitis. Now this little elf on the other hand is pretty confident about the situation. A better term would be arrogant. Look at him stick out his tongue all arrogantly. I guess he's done this kissing thing before. If you look closely at his tongue, you can see he has a bunch of white hairs on the sides of it. Super gross. Anyways, this represents oral hairy leukoplakia. Oral hairy leukoplakia occurs on the lateral tongue and is not scrapable. Sometimes this can be confused with oral candidiasis, but thankfully you can easily distinguish between these two conditions based on whether or not it can be scraped off. Candidiasis can be scraped off, while oral hairy leukoplakia cannot be scraped off. And some students find it difficult to remember which of these conditions can be scraped off and which one cannot be. I like to remember that oral hairy leukoplakia cannot be scraped off. And I do this just by thinking, if hairs were growing off my tongue, could I scrape them off? Nope, you don't just scrub hairs off. However, if you have candida growing on your tongue, you could scrape that off. Now, I want to point out that oral hairy leukoplakia is actually not hair at all. It just has a weird appearance that kind of resembles hair, which gives it that name. So again, tongue with hairs on the side stands for oral hairy leukoplakia. Now let's focus again on this kissing tyrant. Notice how her hair curls behind her ear and on her neck. This draws attention to the fact that EBV infections often cause posterior auricular lymphadenopathy, or LAD, behind the ear. It also causes cervical lymphadenopathy. So again, hair curling behind the ears and on the neck for posterior auricular and cervical lymphadenopathy. Now this girl also has this gaudy cane with a gem on the top of it. Look at the size of that rock. Well, that ornament has an icosahedral shape to it. This represents the icosahedral shape of the EBV capsid. So icosahedral gem for icosahedral capsid. Now look at this guy with a band-aid on his cheek. He is sort of like this girl's lackey and holds up a sign that tells everyone in line how many kisses are left. Right now, it reads, less than 500 kisses remaining. The band-aid represents AIDS. And what's written on the sign represents the fact that oral hairy leukoplakia only occurs when the CD4 T cell count gets below 500. So the point is that EBV infections do not cause oral hairy leukoplakia unless the CD4 count is below 500. If you have ever known someone who got this kissing disease, none of them had white plaques on the sides of their tongue, right? That's because they didn't have CD4 counts below 500. They didn't have AIDS. So again, the sign saying less than 500 kisses left stands for CD4 counts below 500. Now there's an old elf up here in the tower. He's in charge of the whole Elves Blue Village, and he makes sure things are going well. But he's kind of pervy and just watches the kissing booth all day. Look at those ribbons dangling from his lookout tower. These two ribbons represent the fact that EBV is a double-stranded DNA virus. So two parallel ribbons for double-stranded DNA virus. If you haven't noticed already, there's a line starting to form behind the kissing booth. This line represents the fact that EBV is a linear virus. So line of lonely elves for linear virus. Now waiting in line for so long has caused these two fellows to start quite a ruckus. They're fighting with flails. Notice how each flail forms the shape of a T. This stands for T cells. Not only their shape represents T cells, but the fact that flails are close combat weapons reinforces the activity of T cells. T cells are kind of like close range weapons that kill bacteria through direct contact. So anyways, these guys spilled these tea flails everywhere and even caused each other to bleed horribly. Don't worry though, these elves bleed like crazy, even at the smallest nick to their skin. So they do just fine, even when they lose blood like this. In any case, this blood represents a peripheral blood smear. The elves also spilled out the other T-shaped flails they've been carrying. Did you notice how big and glowing they are? Now since elves are only out when it's dark, 
They like to make all their weapons glow in the dark, whenever possible. Anyways, these glowing tea flails have sort of a toxic appearance, like some dangerous toxic glow. This represents cytotoxic T cells. So bringing it all together, the blood represents a peripheral blood smear, and the toxic glowing T-shaped flails represent cytotoxic T cells, which are seen on peripheral blood smears. Now this is a histological sample of a peripheral blood smear in a patient with an active EBV infection. You can see these large cytotoxic T cells scattered throughout. As you can see from these three examples, they are large and have a single nucleus. It's this finding that's given the disease the name mononucleosis, or mono. So again, in EBV infections, cytotoxic T cells are seen on peripheral blood smears. Now this elf back here acts as a guard to the kissing line. He holds up a sign to remind everyone that contact sports are not allowed while in the line. I guess they get scuffles like this one pretty frequently. In any case, this sign hints at the fact that patients with active EBV infections should avoid contact sports. This is because they experience splenomegaly, and the spleen can easily rupture during this period. So be sure to always tell your mono patients to avoid contact sports for at least three to four weeks from the time of symptom onset. Now as nocturnal creatures, the elves like to engage in night activities such as shooting arrows at the stars. And this bow shooting the arrows represents B cells releasing antibodies. Now we like to use bows to represent B cells because they are long range weapons. B cells are kind of like long range weapons because they shoot out antibodies to attack pathogens. So bows shoot arrows, B cells shoot antibodies. Notice how all the arrows launched into the air look different from one another. This represents the heterogeneous activity of the antibodies produced against EBV. And there are two heterogeneous activities to know. One, they attack the EBV virus, and two, they attack horse blood or sheep blood when exposed to it. This is the basic premise of the monospot test. Let me show you how this works. So here's the EBV virus, and the body will form an antibody against the virus, primarily an IgM antibody. Now these antibodies, for whatever reason, also attack sheep or horse RBCs. So when the sheep or horse RBCs are exposed to patients' IgM antibodies, the antibodies agglutinate. And this process is called a monospot test. And when you see this agglutination from the patient's blood, you can confirm an EBV infection. So again, heterogeneous arrows for heterophile antibodies. And did you notice that this elf to the right is shining a light on the arrows, spotting them in the sky? This represents the fact that the monospot test is positive in infected patients. So spotting arrows in the sky for monospot positive. Now life for the elves isn't all kissing booths and nighttime arrow spotting. They actually have routine visits from this large villain. He likes to capture and eat elves. It looks like he caught some right now. Thankfully, this little guy in the front has shot an arrow through the nose of the villain. This must have hurt a lot, through the nose and everything. Nice shot. Well, this arrow, which again represents an antibody produced from a B cell, indicates the nasopharyngeal carcinoma that can occur as a result of the EBV virus. And this is a B cell carcinoma. So arrow through the nose stands for nasopharyngeal B cell carcinoma. Now look at the net the villain uses to catch the critters. It's a net with a lot of little knots along it. This knotted net represents the lymphatic system with its associated lymph nodes. Now the elves that this villain prefers are the ones that wear pink ribbons. I guess he likes the pink against their little purple bodies. Well, these pink ribbons represent cancer. So the lymph net and the cancer ribbons together should make you think of lymph cancer or lymphoma. Now look at this bucket holding all those arrows. This represents Burkitt's lymphoma. The bucket has arrows, which indicates that this is a B cell issue. So again, bucket of arrows for Burkitt's lymphoma. Now look at the sky up here. All those pretty stars. This represents the starry sky appearance on biopsy of Burkitt's lymphoma. Now this is a cancer biopsy of a Burkitt's lymphoma, which many have described as having a starry sky appearance. You can kind of see stars against this big dark background. Now EBV can cause another type of lymphoma, which occurs in the brain of HIV patients. Look at this poor elf getting electrocuted by the villain's shocking power. The shock is so powerful that we can see the little elf's brain. This refers to primary central nervous system lymphoma. On imaging, this appears as ring enhancing lesions. So we've added some rings to the villain's hand. I think it's those rings that give the villain his electric shock power. Let me show you what these ring enhancing lesions look like on imaging. Now this is an MRI showing a ring enhancing lesion down here. Now this finding can be caused by an EBV induced B cell lymphoma or a primary central nervous system lymphoma. It can also be caused by toxoplasmosis. And this means that a ring enhancing lesion is not pathognomonic for EBV. So on a test, if you're shown a ring enhancing lesion like this, be careful to pay close attention to the vignette to make sure you don't easily fall for toxo or EBV. In the question stem, you can always tell which it is. It's important to know that a primary central nervous system lymphoma 
occurs in HIV patients, particularly those whose CD4 count has fallen below 100. Now look at this little elf holding up that $100 bill. The poor guy's trying to pay off the evil villain so he will just leave the village in peace. Now this $100 bill represents the CD4 count of 100 or below. So again, the villain has that band-aid on his right thumb holding that poor guy's head, and the little guy's holding up that $100 bill to try to tell the guy to leave. This represents the fact that primary central nervous system lymphomas occur in HIV patients when CD4 counts are below 100. Now that we've covered the items in the image, let's do a question to apply what you've learned. A 15-year-old obese girl presents to the clinician with a fever and a sore throat. Upon further discussion, the girl states that she has felt tired for the past several days. She has felt healthy prior to this illness and does not complain of any other symptoms. Physical examination does not reveal any noticeable organomegaly in the left upper quadrant of her abdomen. Her blood is drawn and a lab test confirms the presence of heterophile antibodies. Which of the following is most likely true about her condition? A. The patient had a sexual encounter before acquiring the infection. B. A double-stranded RNA virus is the likely pathogen. C. The patient may have a lymphocytic neoplasm in her brain. Or D. She should avoid contact sports for at least three weeks. Now hopefully you notice that this girl has infectious mononucleosis, or an EBV infection. She has a fever, sore throat, and fatigue. And her heterophile antibody test was positive. With this in mind, the correct choice is D. She should avoid contact sports for at least three weeks. Now you may have noticed that she didn't have any splenal megaly that you could appreciate on exam. The vignette states, physical exam does not reveal any noticeable organomegaly in the left upper quadrant. Now the left upper quadrant is where one would examine the spleen, but not feeling the spleen does not mean she is not at risk of splenic rupture. Splenomegaly is so common with infectious mononucleosis that one should always caution against contact sports for at least three weeks. Plus, the patient is obese, and this adds an additional chance of error to the physical exam maneuver to palpate her spleen. And remember this guy back here? He's holding that sign saying no contact sports, and this makes reference to splenomegaly, and the chance of splenic rupture in patients with EBV or mono infections. Now choice A is wrong because EBV is not considered a sexually transmitted disease. You get it through kissing, not through intercourse. And choice B is incorrect because EBV is a double-stranded DNA virus, not a double-stranded RNA virus. And finally, choice C is wrong because primary central nervous system lymphoma only occurs in HIV patients particularly when their CD4 counts fall below 100, and this patient demonstrates no evidence of having an HIV infection. So again, the correct answer is D.